Hey, welcome back. How are you doing? My first time in Lisbon, uh, and beautiful city. I didn't know there'd be quite so much pollen this time of year, so I'm, I am struggling a bit, so bear with me. I have my water with me. Um, I'd like to tell you a bit of a story this afternoon. Once upon a time, about 26 years ago, in fact, there was a fresh-faced young computer scientist, and he was sitting in his office uh, at CERN, the nuclear uh, research facility in Geneva. Some call him Tim. Tim Berners-Lee, he was frustrated. All the academic research papers that he wanted to access were locked away in libraries and research facilities around the world, all separated and scattered, even though these papers frequently cross-reference one another. So he had an idea. He had an idea for a network of connected documents with some governing principles to, to structure it. The first principle is that we would all uh, create and publish our documents using a common markup format. The second principle was that there would be a common system of addresses um, uh, used to uh, identify and locate each document resource. And the third and most important principle is that there will be a common means of linking these documents together. So he sent off his proposal to his boss and the feedback came back. Vague but exciting. <laughs> the web was a gift to, a wo to the world, right? Unparalleled access to information, decentralized, democratic, allowing us to have these new and exciting and unplanned ways of connecting information together for the betterment of understanding, for the betterment of mankind. And what do we do with it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> this was the 90s. Anyone remember the hamster dance? What amazing things we published. We had such fun <laughs> with our dancing babies. A web full of content, of information, so much so that it gave rise to a practice of human information architects who came along to make sense of the mess, uh, to coin a phrase. And, uh, and millions and millions of documents were published. And a, you know, a well-written document is a joy forever. But we started to realize something, that these documents frequently referenced real-world things, people and places and ideas and concepts and all kinds of good stuff. But they did so in a way that only us humans could understand. Now, humans are very good at stuff, I'm told. Um, we're very good at understanding meaning. We can tell you the difference between a review of Casablanca the City and Casablanca the movie. We know that if we just tag our content with a keyword, then our understanding of what Apple means might change as we move from context to context. And of course, we all know, don't we, that New Orleans Square is a land within Disneyland, which is a theme park in Anaheim, California. Uh, created by Walt Disney, and that New Orleans Square is home to the Haunted Mansion attraction. Of course we know that. And if we didn't, we could read this Wikipedia article, and we could pick out not only those things, but understand the relationships between them. But to a computer, it's all just stuff. Our documents live in this kind of flatland, and a computer isn't really able to pass out the things and relationships that, they, that the documents refer to. If they could, hmm, if they could, we could just ask the computer a question. How tall is Mount Everest? Where can I get a beer? Of course, the computer would need to know what beer was, what where means, where I was, and also, indeed, the answer to the question. Or maybe we could just ask the computer to return results based on a certain set of criteria. 
and thus glean some interesting insights into human behavior. So there's a lot of good in publishing information, a lot of opportunity um, in publishing information that computers can make sense of and not just people. So much so that six years ago, back in 2009 at the web's 20th anniversary, Tim Berners-Lee came back to us and said, publish your raw data on the internet. Don't massage it, don't clean it up, don't wait till you've built some beautiful big website around it, just publish it, raw data now, he said. And he came back with even more governing principles for how we should do that. The first principle was that we needed to use those HTTP web addresses from way back in the day, the URIs, let's call them, to stand in for things. So I would have a URI to denote me. So would Lisbon, so would UX Lisbon, so would all of you, so would the practice of information architecture, the practice of user experience design, every concept, person, place, or thing. As Abby said before the break, if, something, if we can point at something, we can agree on it. If something's got a URI, then we can point to it from across the, the web whenever we want to make reference to it. It becomes this fixed common reference point which disambiguates and indeed defines the damn thing. And we can express how those things relate to one another wherever they're located. The second rule uh, that Tim came back to us with was that that, that data that's returned should be uh, useful data and returned in a standard format, the kind of information I'd like to know about a person, a place, or a thing, and ideally in a way that I can reuse and that a computer can make sense of too. And the third, and again the most important rule, is that it's got relationships. So this is not just information about my height or my weight or my shoe size, but that I am speaking at UX Lisbon, that I know Abby or Adrian or any of the, anybody else, that I'm from Bolton in England. I am. And whenever a relationship is expressed between those things, each one of those things is given an HTTP address to identify it. So by insisting on relationships, this connective tissue between people and places and things creates a web of machine-readable data that sits on top of that flat web of documents. This he called linked data. And by connecting that raw data, you're, you're creating a much richer, arguably, arguably more useful network of knowledge than just connecting documents alone. Research can be much more precise when you're comparing data sets rather than just searching the text of a web page, as these researchers uh, trying to look into Alzheimer's disease found out. So by linking different sets of data, we can create better, make more sense of information and create new value across all kinds of markets. We can even bootstrap content-rich products when we've got no content of our own. Now, a few of you were kind enough to indulge me in some content modeling yesterday. Um, let's remind ourselves of what we mean by a content model. Here again, Walt Disney World, a real resort that has a real location in Orlando, Florida. It has a number of parks within it, of which the Magic Kingdom is one. Each park has a number of lands, of which Tomorrowland is one. And of course, as every Disney fan knows, each park has a weenie. Uh, the architectural central device that anchors you to the middle of the park. This is the castle in the Magic Kingdom, big ball in Epcot. Uh, each land has a number of attractions, and those attractions will have been created by a Disney Imagineer, and in some cases based on some prior art, like a movie or a book or something like that. Uh, the uh, resorts also have hotels, which Disney confusingly also calls resorts. Those hotels have restaurants. The lands also have restaurants. Uh, the restaurants have meals, and because this is Disney, the meals are associated with a particular character who themselves may be based on a bit of prior art. Content model. By modeling the things and relationships that exist within a subject domain, you're taking a sort of more holistic mental modeling view of a subject. 
the things that people care about, regardless of whether your business actually has that bit of content or not. In that sense, content models model your version of truth rather than your website requirements. And if you're very thorough in your content modeling, as my tidied up version shows, you haven't just labeled the boxes, but you've labeled the arrows too. And you're describing the nature of the relationship between those two things, such as saying that an Imagineer created an attraction. But our content model is a general form. It describes in general how kinds of things relate to kinds of other things. Let's try a specific example and use Tim Berners-Lee as advice uh, and use HTTP addresses to describe each thing. And actually, let's pinch a third one to describe the relationship itself. So here we go. The Haunted Mansion is located in New Orleans Square with a URI to denote the Haunted Mansion. Not terribly complicated. This is just a web page that is all about the Haunted Mansion. Over here, we have a web page, Wikipedia page, all about New Orleans Square. Um, and we've borrowed a third uh, URI from a common vocabulary, um, indeed the GeoNames ontology, that serves to gr give us that verb. It sort of defines what, th what the idea of located in means. So we've written out this sentence in a way that a computer can understand. This fact that we've asserted is a piece of data. It's a piece of machine-readable data, but there's a very small problem, that these resources that we've defined here, uh, this Haunted Mansion page on, on the Disneyland site and the Wikipedia um, New Orleans Square site, they're designed for humans. Remember that rule of returning information in a way that a computer can make sense of? Now, we have a standard method of publishing uh, documents on the web, HTML. Shouldn't there be a standard method of publishing linked data? Well, in fact, there is, and there's more than one. But today we're going to talk about RDF, the Resource Description Framework, what you might think of as a sort of lingua franca for publishing data on the web. And it works exactly as we've described, with a structure of noun, verb, noun, or more correctly, subject, predicate, object. And this little three-part story about who did what to what is called a triple. Now, there's various ways you can write RDF down. That's a very scary slide full of code. Um, you can do it um, in very long form notation where you're basically writing those three statements down or, or there's more compact versions like Turtle. Uh, and these get stored in a, in a database that's full of triples and we call it a triple store. And if we make our data openly available, then our triple store is available for anybody anywhere in the world to query uh, and connect their data to. So, a little abstract diagram. So this is our facts. This is, these are our nouns, and we're going to connect them with some verbs. And then over here, eventually, there we go, the BBC, say, and the New York Times have done the same thing. But if everybody publishes their data out in RDF, and if we want to express a relationship from any one thing to any other thing, then we simply join the dots to connect one triple to another triple, not just within our own triple store, but anywhere in, across the web. The idea is as simple and as democratic as linking to a web page. But this time, we're doing it directly for data, thinking about our architecture at web scale how the content and the data we create meshes into the bigger picture of the web. That's kind of a theme. So it helps, therefore, if we have a common vocabulary, a sort of set of shared and agreed keys that we can reference when we're um, defining a specific thing. Similar to how if we, you know, you're trying to explain a concept to somebody, you might send them to the Wikipedia page. Again, great for humans. What about computers? If only there was like a machine-readable version of Wikipedia. Like this one, this is DBpedia. Um, and it's an effort to create structured content from Wikipedia data. For any concept, it holds a bunch of related data that a computer can read. Here is Disneyland. I'm sure that other um, concepts are available. Um, 
So I can ask DBpedia when Disneyland first opened. Where exactly on earth is it located? What attractions can I find there? All as if it was in my own database. And thus I can surface that information directly on my own website. Valuable content, valuable information, created by the crowd and available to me for free. Music Brains is another one. This time about music identification and uh, it's a database for humans and for robots uh, to identify and connect artists and albums and songs and labels and genres of music, all that good stuff, all published uh, as linked open data and free to me to plunder to add value to my product. So using these kind of shared third party identifiers, I can say that any piece of content, any web page for sake of argument that I create refers to a specific concept identified by the URI at another service. I'm connecting my page to a web of data by stating that the concept I'm referring to, China or what have you, is not China plates or indeed the, the, the Pao song China in your hand, um, but is in fact the China, the country, um, as defined by DBpedia, and I'm connecting myself into this web of data and opening the gateways for, uh, to allow data to flow across the web. Which is all very well. Um, but how are people actually using this? Well, let's look at the BBC. They've got 10 national radio stations, and they wanted to get people to listen to the radio a bit more. Um, each of those radio stations caters to a different audience demographic, and they play different kinds of music, therefore. So how can I figure out which stations, indeed, which shows I want to listen to? Well, the web team went to the radio people, and they uncovered a gold mine of data. Um, at a radio station, uh, there's a, a log maintained of every song that gets played out on air, and they do that to keep the music licensing people happy so that the artists ultimately get paid. And it was just sitting there, updated all the time, no one doing anything with it except the purpose it was designed for. This was a, a constantly updated database of every song ever played out, listing the radio station it was played out on and the show that it was played out on, Goodness gracious, business as usual for, for radio, but no one had ever considered the value of publishing out this data. But it's only a piece of the puzzle. So the web team were able to take that bit of data and mash it up with some data from uh, Music Brains that says, well, okay, what other stuff has this music artist done? What albums have they put out? Uh, and indeed, DBpedia that could give you like a full written bi a biography of that band or album. And indeed, the other, the, another bit of the BBC, which might give you some stuff around when that band uh, or artist was on the TV. And from out of almost nothing, they created a new product for exploring music. Here's the page for Blondie. For almost any artist now on the BBC, played out on the BBC, there's a music artist page. But only some of the data is coming from the BBC all the other rich content, the biographies and the discographies, uh, and indeed the contextual links to related artists, are coming from third-party services. Rather thrillingly, Music Brains allows people like you and me to create their own profile. Um, is you can list your songs and your, your blog and your YouTube videos and your SoundCloud page and stuff like that. And because the BBC Music site is powered effectively by these Music Brains records, this Music Brains linked data, guess what? Any information uh, updated there is used to generate a BBC Music page. So if you've ever wanted to get your ukulele trio band on the BBC, this is a, this is a good way to do it. Again, thinking at web scale, thinking of the whole web as a content management system. So we can use linked data to build up a composite picture of a topic. Even if all the facts are held by different providers, it doesn't really matter. With linked data, we're thinking about information architecture, content strategy, product management even at web scale. The web becomes one big database. And it is getting better, bigger. Um, just a few years ago, back in 2007, there was only a handful really of services that were linking to each other in this way and sharing that data. 
uh, last year it looked like this. Um, it reminds me of the early days of the web, this diagram in particular, when, the, when there were these books published that listed all the world's websites. <laughs> I don't know if you're old enough to remember these things. Um, yeah, imagine a world where there is, are as many data sources to play with as there are websites. Well, it's starting to happen already. You can help. You can start marking up your content with RDF. Maybe you can define and publish your own ontology based on your content modeling work. Uh, and you can go on a quest. Using the linked data cloud as your treasure map, you can go hunting for sources of third party information. Make use of the valuable data and content that it would be otherwise too expensive uh, and difficult to maintain. This is it's IA, it's content strategy, it's product management, it's experience design at web scale. And playing is the key. This morning, Lisa talked to us about the a supply chain for information and, and architecting the information age. Possibly this data can be a, a raw material. We have a world full of data sources, data sources to play with. What would you do with them? Perhaps our, our job is, is not just about making sense of the information that's within our business, but starting to wrangle and recombine the data that's available on the web and recombine it in new and useful ways. Because the web is bigger than any of us. Tim Berners-Lee said its most important facet is its universality. And we should embrace that, I think. We should create and structure and publish our content. And when we do so, think not only what is this doing for my customers, but how is this benefiting the web as a whole? You might think of it as corporate social responsibility for the digital age. So last year, the web turned 25. As of now, we're in the, the next 25 years. Web 2.0, you might say. What will it be like? Well, some of us were right there, back at the start, back in the early days, struggling with our clunky command line tools and our dial-up modems, yet overwhelmed by the dizzying possibility of publishing live from our bedroom to the world. We hear a, we hear a lot these days about, um, uh, about busting out of UX silos. Um, to talk, talking to the business and bridging business divisions and sharing knowledge. And right from the start, the web itself was designed to do exactly this. Uh, through its most important element, the hyperlink. As designers, we connect with people to connect them to information. And the web was designed for exactly this, building bridges of understanding by connecting knowledge. But right now, I think we've got a kind of a fear of commitment. We don't seem to really want to build for the long term. In this world, you're either a truck business or you're a highway business, a product or a service level infrastructure, an API, if you will. We have product managers, but where are all the service managers? Products like trucks, they come and go, but services, the data-driven highways of the internet, can last much longer. And the future of knowledge sharing on the web needs us to open up these pathways. We're capable of taming the roots and branches of knowledge and making limitless connections across boundaries. Information architecture, as Abby told us, it's not just site mapping and card sorting. We need to become adept at understanding and working with the native fabric of information, the native fabric of the web. Now, you've heard all this before, right? Designers should code. Yeah, by which they mean HTML and CSS markup. And rightly so, you know, I think. Uh, as Brad referred to this um, painting pictures of websites and the art of the possible continues to outstrip what can be done through static images. But when I, when I as at 41, hear designers should code, I do think back to the stuff that I grew up with, um, back when computers were fascinating. Um, these are the books I had as a kid. I don't know if you're familiar with any of them. Um, learning to program in basic, learning to write your own games. Z80 and 6502 machine code for eight, nine-year-olds. Um, 
heady days. And it's starting to come back, you know, kids tinkering with their Raspberry Pis, people learning to program computers at, at the most elemental level. We can't allow ourselves to become a lost generation of people who work with computers without really understanding how they work. Not so long ago, the tools for publishing HTML were bad. They were rough, they, you know, they were rough and ready, they were simple. Um, but now anyone can do it. These are still admittedly early days for linked data, and the tools are similarly bad, and the easy fixes aren't there. But perhaps where that's where we can help too, crafting better tools which democratize the process of making and reusing data, which itself so wants to be democratic. That linked data community is still a, a, it's a cottage industry, albeit one with inherently global intent. Like us, they believe in building connections and sharing knowledge, knowledge and, uh, and architecting understanding. Perhaps we should hang out with them. It's all one web. So let us play in this decentralized, de-siloed, and democratic, and data-driven information space, never forgetting that a small group of committed citizens can change the world, because indeed it's the only thing that ever has. Thank you very much. <laughs>